Sorry. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming back to <laughs> this session. Um, my name is Daniel Malowski, and I'm a PhD student with Dr. Hilary Martin at the Wilkins Sanger Institute. And I'll be discussing work that I've been doing looking at associations between autozygosity and disease across the phenotypic spectrum. Autozygosity is defined as homozygosity in the genome that arises due to alleles that are inherited identical by descent. Or in other words, these are alleles that are inherited from both of your parents that they each inherited from the same common ancestors. There are two reproductive practices that increase autozygosity in the genome. The first being endogamy, which is reproduction within a restricted group, uh, such as Ashkenazi Jews, as well as consanguinity, which is reproduction with close relatives, typically between individuals that are second cousins or closer. If you look to the map at the right, you'll notice that consanguinity is practiced throughout the world, with regions that have higher degrees of consanguinity being in darker red. And you'll notice that the highest uh, autozygosity uh, consanguinity is practiced in uh, North Africa, the Middle East, as well as some regions of South Asia, notably Pakistan. The primary genetic effect of consanguinity is that it increases the length and such or the number of fully homozygous haplotypes in an individual's genome, and these intuitively are called runs of homozygosity. We can quantify the degree of consanguinity by calculating an individual's fraction of the genome in runs of homozygosity which is referred to as F-Rho. One's F-Rho is related to an individual's parent relatedness or kinship coefficient. So for example, the expected F-Rho for an individual with parents that are siblings is 25%, for an individual with parents who are first cousins, 6.25%, and so on. I will discuss results from two different data sets, UK Biobank and Genes and Health. Genes and Health is a population-based cohort of British Pakistanis and Bangladeshis primarily recruited from East London. There are approximately 50,000 individuals with 60% being Bangladeshi and the other 40% being Pakistani. This cohort has linked electronic health records as well as self-reported parental relatedness information and about 20% of the individuals in the cohort reported having related parents. So next, I'll discuss some work that I've done characterizing consanguinity and genes and health cohort. So um, we didn't want to just rely on the reported degree of parental relatedness, but we also wanted to see if we could infer the degree of an individual's parental relatedness based on the distribution of runs of homozygosity and their genome. So we developed a simulation and machine learning based approach in order to classify individuals under different degrees of inferred parental relatedness. The way that we did this is from uh, the cohort, we randomly chose individuals with phase genotype data and, oh, excuse me, and we modeled recombination to produce gametes. And then we were able to simulate reproduction under various consanguineous schemes, such as ha individuals that have parents that are siblings, individuals that have parents that are avuncular, and that means parents that, such as um, an uncle and uh, niece union, um, in individuals that have parents that are first cousins, first cousins once removed, second cousins, or unrelated. And if you may have noticed that I said that we also modeled um, consanguinity under uh, for first cousins with multiple generations of consanguinity. And here is just, I'm just highlighting what that family tree might look like. So next on the simulated individual was we call runs of homozygosity, and then we train a neural network uh, um, to classify individuals for their d given degree of consanguinity based on the frequency of rows and their genomes of bent lengths. So ultimately, this uh, method classifies individuals based on their parental relatedness for 10 different categories. Um, and then we further classify these 10 categories under three uh, broader categories, uh, having parents that are inferred to be first cousins or closer, having parents that are inferred to be first cousins once removed and second cousins, or having parents that are inferred to be further than second cousins. <clears throat> 
So here we summarize consanguinity and UK Biobank in genes and health. And UK Biobank, we analyze individuals of European ancestry as well as South Asian ancestry. And green is the proportion of individuals for each cohort that have inferred parents that are unrelated. And pink is individuals with parents that are inferred to be first cousins or closer. And in, uh, so, excuse me, second cousins or first cousins once removed. And in blue are individuals with parents inferred to be first cousins or closer. So you'll notice that in UKB Europeans, only 2% have parents that are inferred to be related, with the majority of this parental relatedness being a uh, second cousin relationship. But in UKB South Asians, 29% are inferred to have parents that are related, and the rate is even higher in the genes and health cohort. And you'll notice that it is the genes and health Pakistanis that have the highest rate of consanguinity, with over 25% inferred to have parents that are first cousins or closer. Next, we wanted to assess phenotypic associations with autozygosity. So as a bit of background, inbreeding depression or decreased fitness due to elevated autozygosity is ubiquitously observed across species. A great example is below, where they studied a wild deer population in Scotland and found that the number of progeny a deer had adjusted for age decreased with increased autozygosity. There are various mechanisms proposed for why this might be the case, such as autozygosity increasing the probability of inheriting deleterious recessive variants, heterozygote advantage, such as in the case of sickle cell anemia, or because autozygosity increases additive variants of um, the genetic uh, predisposition to a trait. Various studies have attempted to assess associations between complex traits and autozygosities in humans, but, and many such associations have been found, but as you can imagine, there is severe confounding due to social and environmental correlates of consanguinity that complicate interpretations. And in various cultures, consanguinity is known to be associated with the degree of religiosity of an individual, with their SES, among other measures. As a concrete example, Abdullawi et al. found a protective effect of autozygosity on major depressive disorder risk, but once they controlled for religiosity, the association disappeared, and this was conducted in a Dutch population. Uh, the largest study assessing inbreeding depression of humans was conducted by Clark et al., where they meta-analyzed results across many cohorts for 100 traits, and they found many associations namely 32, um, and they found them across different classes of complex traits, including anthropometric measures such as height and weight, cognitive measures, fertility, as well as behavioral measures such as decreased driving speed and number of alcohol units drank per week. However, when they did a between-sibling analysis, um, to, uh, at these traits because these analyses were conducted in unrelated individuals, they only found 25 nominally significant asso associations that replicated and only two associations replicated after multiple testing correction. And 20% of the effect sizes in the sibling-based analysis were not concordant with the analysis in unrelated individuals, indicating potential confounding. Autozygosity increases the probability of harboring deleterious recessive variants linearly, so we expect to see a dosage effect across the range of Afro values. This is uh, some more plots from the Clark et al. paper, and as you can see for height, this dosage effect is consistent across the range of Afro, but in educational attainment, this dosage effect is not observed in higher degrees of autozygosity, again suggesting potential confounding in the study. So we sought to better control for environmental confounding associated with consanguinity in a studies assessing uh, associations between autozygosity and uh, various phenotypes. So the, we consider a few different uh, statistical models. The first is a model where we include Afro as the main covariate of interest, as well as uh, various other uh, covariates, such as 20 genetic PCs, sex, age, IBD-based clusters, which capture better fine-scale population structure than just genetic PCs, as well as the Townsend Deprivation Index, which is a measure of deprivation. 
But then we also considered model two, where we include covariates. One is a binary variable indicating whether an individual has parents that are inferred to be first cousins or closer, and one that indicates whether an individual is inferred to have parents that are first cousins once removed or second cousins. And the idea here is that these binary uh, variables will capture the environmental component associated with consanguinity or um, a, 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 the environmental component of consanguinity associated with the given trait. And lastly, we consider a model where it's exactly the same as model one, but we restrict to individuals that are inferred to have parents that are first cousins or closer. We use quasi-Poisson general linear models for count variables, logistic for binary variables, and standard Gaussian models for continuous variables. And the effect sizes I'll show for F rho are for F rho equaling 0 0.0625 instead of F rho equaling 1, because no one has an F rho of 1, so it's not really that informative. But also, uh, 0 0.065, an F rho of 0 0.065 is the expected F rho for individuals that have parents that are first cousins. So first, in genes and health, we checked known associations between F rho and uh, height and weight. And we see that in model 1, model 2, and model 1 restricted to first cousins, we see significant associations with height and weight after multiple testing correction. We then sought to revisit some of the significant associations found in Clark et al. So we conducted uh, analyses um, in UKB Europeans where they have measures of fluid intelligence, educational attainment, as well as other uh, behavioral measures. And we find that the cognitive um, associations hold in model two, but we find that many associations are completely attenuated after we control for the environmental component of consanguinity. Uh, the strongest such attenuation was in the religiosity variable. And here I'm showing the effect sizes for those binary variables in model two, with the purple showing the effect sizes for individuals that are inferred to have parents that are second cousins or first cousins once removed, and in red, uh, the effect size for individuals that have parents that are first cousins or closer. And you'll notice that there are significant associations between the, this environmental component of consanguinity and these various traits. You'll notice that the environmental component of consanguinity is associated with decreased fluid intelligence, decreased alcohol intake, and increased religiosity. We next sought to define phenotypes in the genes and health cohort using electronic health records. So we used the ICD-10 disease classification system structure to do so. Um, the electronic health records in uh, the UK are mostly coded in ICD-10 codes as well as SNOMED codes, which can be converted to ICD-10 codes, which is what we did. And then we use the tree structure of the ICD-10 uh, classification system to generate our phenotypes. Um, a specific disease such as, for example, iron deficiency anemia is classed under a subchapter, in this case, nutritional anemias. And these subchapters are further classified under specific ch chapters. So we binarized whether an individual had a specific subchapter reflected in their electronic health records, and we analyzed various phenotypes. One is we just summed up the total number of subchapters in each chapter, which reflects the number of diseases an individual has in a certain organ system, roughly. The other is we summed up the total number of subchapters in an individual's health records. And lastly, we summed up the total number of ch chapters reflected in an individual's health record. So here, the dotted line shows um, the case where there is no effect. And above the dotted line, it indicates that there is a positive effect or association between autozygosity and the given variable. So here, and the confidence bands are showing a multiple testing adjusted 95% um, um, confidence intervals. And we found that there are significantly positive associations between uh, F rho and the total number of subchapters as well as the total number of chapters reflected in an individual's health records. And then when we looked at the other 14 chapters that we analyzed, we find the strongest association is between autozygosity and congenital disorders, uh, which is as expected, but also we find associations across um, 
multiple other chapters showing this pervasive effect of autozygosity's impact on disease. We find that seven associations were found to be significant in all three models considered, but there were four that were only significant using model one. And also interestingly, we found one association that is only significant after controlling for the environmental component of consanguinity, um, namely the neurological chapter. And uh, counterintuitively, we found that the environmental component of consanguinity is negatively associated with the number of diseases reflected in an individual's health record, which is contrary to what we thought would be the case. And we see this across several chapters. And so there are two potential hypotheses that we considered. One is that individuals that are consanguineous have decreased health seeking behavior, so are less likely to have a disease actually reflected in their electronic health records, or that there's a protective effect of being in a consanguineous environment in this population. So we sought to test this directly. Individuals in the UK um, between the age of 40 to 75 are invited to attend an NHS health check, which is a voluntary health assessment. So we extracted whether an individual attended their uh, NHS health check and tested for associations between um, having parents that are related and the probability of having attended one's NHS health check. And we do indeed find a decreased probability of having attended one's NHS health check if their parents are related, suggesting that for individuals with related parents in this population, uh, they have decreased health seeking behavior. And lastly, we sought to replicate these associations between EFRO and the various chapters in UK Biobank. So we did this for model two. Um, in orange, you'll see the association detected in UKB Europeans and pink in UKB South Asians. And in black are the meta-analyzed values. We find that six associations complete to replicate after multiple testing correction, eight nominally replicate, and all have concordant directions of effect sizes. And, and we also see that the point estimates for model two in the genes and health cohort and the point estimate for the meta-analyzed values are quite concordant. So in conclusion, we found that adding parental relatedness to association models with EFRO controls for confounding associated with consanguinity. We find that EFRO is associated with diseases of various organ systems as well as overall health. We find consanguineous British Pakistanis and Bangladeshis have decreased health seeking behaviors and that these associations replicate well in UK Biobank. I would like to thank uh, everyone in the Martin group, as well as our collaborators from other institutions, as well as the participants in the Genes and Health and UKB studies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. So, questions? So shall we start, uh, then John? Thanks, sir, it's very interesting. Um, I've never quite understood uh, what the point is of looking at autozygosity, like runs of homozygosity, as opposed to just looking at the like sort of global homozygosity across the genome, because there's you know, very simple relationships between Hardy Weinberg equilibrium and the amount of homozygosity you see. You can calculate F statistics and estimate those. So I'd, I'd, I've never understood why it seems like it's kind of overcomplicating things a bit to sort of calculate these runs of homozygosity. Um, have you have you looked at whether that gives you additional power to detect these things, for example, or because uh, it you know it could be by introducing like extra com complication might explain some of the differences between data sets and things. Yes, absolutely. So um, the re. Uh, Perhaps when you have uh, whole genome sequencing data, just measuring uh, homozygosity it will be a good approach. But when you have a SNP genotype data, you are restricted to the SNPs that were actually genotyped. And the idea here also is that, uh, while well, with the runs of homozygosity, you're able to track autozygosity even in, in, even in regions that are, aren't directly uh, sequenced, or in this case, genotypes. And the idea of these associations is that autozygosity is probably uh, increasing the risk of these diseases due to rare deleterious variants, which are not captured with the um, by the actual genotype SNPs. So by looking at runs of homozygosity, 
these are able to pick up these regions that would actually have these rare recessive variants. And in fact, in our, our cohort, when we use um, other uh, approaches to calculate autozygosity, such as FGRM, uh, for those familiar, we see uh, because the cohort is so consanguineous, the correlation between FRO and FGRM is 0.99. Um, so these measures are quite correlated no matter how you calculate them. John? Hiya, thanks. Uh, so, uh, John Whitaker from the MRC Biostats Unit. Um, I, to, Two, two things. One is on the organ systems. I mean, so my experience of trying to look at um, ontologies in that way is that they can be really heterogeneous with one, as soon as you start clustering things, that you cluster things which are not at all common, uh, not at all the same in terms of the causal mechanisms. So if you do it by organ system, you can end up clustering, I don't know, cancers and immune disorders of the gut together, which makes no sense mechanistically. So I wonder that some of the variation you see there is actually just a result of how um, simple the causal mechanisms, how, how much that clustering makes sense rather than anything meaningful. Absolutely. Um, we looked at various clustering approaches. I'll, I'll note that cancers, for example, are not included in any of these disease or organ systems. Um, and um, so we also used latent clustering approaches to uh, based uh, looking at the specific diseases rather than the clustering based on the chapters. And we find that there's actually really high concordance when you do latent clustering as w while, as opposed to this direct uh, um, ICD-10 based clustering. Um, and uh, so, but that, that, that is very much an issue that, you know, when, when you do clustering, you might be grouping heterogeneous disorders together. So that's definitely a limitation. Yeah, and then I, if, I, if I may, one follow up to the last point, which is, I, I get you're looking at different variants to the usual GWAS when you look at the, the runs of you know th th this kind of approach. Do you think you're finding you would find different genes, and it, using a recessive any, model? Or? Well, no. By um, you're essentially looking for places where people are homozygous, <laughs> and then you've got a kind of global average of that over the genome. But do you think so presumably it matters where the homozygosity is. Absolutely. And, you know, if you try and look at that, do you find different genes to the ones that come up in GWAS or sequencing studies or anything else? Yeah, that is ongoing work to try to find map where these associations are actually originated. But uh, some preliminary work is showing that uh, it's homozygosity, uh, particularly in um, the HLA locus, that it's probably uh, driving a lot of these associations. But um, I still need to do a lot of QC on that part of the work to make sure that that's real. All right. That's great. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thank you. So the next speaker is Trevor Cousins from the University of Cambridge and the head of the topic's difference from ancestral population structure from single diploid sequences. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Trevor Cousins. I'm a PhD student with uh, Richard Durbin and Eowyn Scully in the Department of Genetics here in Cambridge. And today my talk is going to be about uh, inference of ancestral population structure from a single diploid genome sequence. Okay, so the space we're working in is this kind of reconstruction of um, human evolutionary genetics. Uh, recently, there's been a lot of researchers who propose that there's evidence for uh, anatomically modern humans, i.e. us, mixing with uh, these kind of ghost archaic humans. And maybe some of you are aware there's been a lot of evidence that we've mixed with Neanderthals and Denisovans. But recently, there's been a lot, a lot of evidence as well that we mixed with these kind of 
what we call a ghost population where we don't have any data from them, but um, that these, these groups of people being some kind of archaic human. So a key method to detect uh, changes in evolutionary history would be PSMC. This is the pairwise sequentially Markovian coalescent. Uh, what it does is it takes a single diploid genome sequence from an individual and it can reconstruct the changes in population size over time. So as you can see here, there's a few different individuals. Uh, this is a plot from the original publication by Lee and Durbin. Uh, from for example, if we take uh, a European individual, we can see that we can trace their evolutionary history uh, through time and how their population size of their ancestors changes. So in PSMC's model, it will assume that a population was panmictic. And uh, when I say panmictic, I mean it was this population was in isolation, i.e. that there was no mixing with any other populations. Um, but it's a kind of well-known effect of this model that if there is some kind of population mixing, which we call structure, which is kind of a, a proxy word for admixture with these archaic commonins, if there was structure, then this kind of influence returned by PSMC is kind of misleading or not necessarily representative of the truth. So my project is about whether we can implement some kind of detection of population structure into PSMC. As a kind of refresher on PSMC, it's a Markov model where the emissions are either um, uh, whether at its position in the sequence, whether it's homozygous or heterozygous, i.e. a SNP, which would have arisen as, as some mutation in the common ancestor. And the hidden states are the time to most recent common ancestor, i.e. the time at which in each segment of the genome, uh, this segment shares a common ancestor. As a kind of schematic, if you have a lot of mutations or a lot of SNPs in one region, you expect the common ancestor to be a long time ago because you've had a lot of time to accumulate mutations. And similarly, if you have a, uh, a long run of homozygosity, then you expect a recent common ancestor because uh, you have a few mutations. And the workhorse for PSMC to do to fit this model is the transition matrix, which is the probability of switching between each coalescing time. And because we work in a discrete space, but time is continuous, we we formulate time into a series of discrete windows, non-overlapping windows, and this transition matrix is the probability of coalescing, uh, of switching between coalescence times as you move along the genome. So to start thinking about if we can implement some kind of model of structure, uh, we need to think about what exactly we want to model. So we use this pulse model, and there's kind of two ways you can think about this. You can either think about it going forwards in time, or you think about it going backwards in time, which is also known as coalescent time. So in terms of forwards in time, it means you have a population that splits in two, which we call A and B, and that some time later, they come back together to form, or well, there's some kind of admixture event where a certain number of lineages in one population instantaneously migrates into the other. And the other way of looking at this model would be to have a series of uh, lineages in population A, and at time TS going backwards, a certain fraction of these migrate into B, and they remain isolated for a certain period until they uh, they come back together again at time TE to form this ancestral population. So the parameters we seek to infer are the changes in population size A, which is what PSMC is doing, uh, but we also seek to infer changes in B, uh, gamma, which is the split fraction, so the proportion of lineages that are introgressing, and the split and rejoin times, TS and TE. So uh, how can we start thinking about this question? How can we start approaching it? Uh, well, the first thing to think about is the coalescent rate, because this is what PSMC is detecting. The coalescent rate is um, it's like the probability that two lineages coalesce at any time. So if we consider a structured model, a simple structured model where we have a constant population size, um, but there's some kind of split and rejoin event, we can generate the coalescent rate for this as given by the blue line, which is hidden behind this orange line. And then if you consider another model that's panmictic but has population size changes such that it generates the same curve, as you can see in the, da in the dotted orange, if you measure the transition matrix for these two histories, then we see that they, uh, they are distinct from each other. For example, we measure the transition matrix for the structured model, measure the transition matrix for the panmictic model, and we look at the relative differences between them, we see that there's, there are differences in the structured period. And to us, this indicates that the transition matrix should have some information that we can use to distinguish uh, panmixia from structure. So as I mentioned previously, the, uh, the kind of workhorse of PSMC is this transition matrix, 
And this transition matrix is governed by a model called the sequentially Markovian coalescent. And what this says is it formulates your ancestry along the genome as a Markov chain. And it says your current coalescent time is only dependent on the previous coalescent time. It's a nice model that allows us to do kind of inference like this. And it says, if you have a recombination, then there's three things that your lineage can do. You can either coalesce to the other lineage, coalesce to your same lineage, or coalesce to your ancestral lineage. But if we're considering the structured model, i.e. this pulse model, then we have some further complexity where this lineage can actually migrate into our other population. This kind of induces lots of mutual exclusiveness and uh, the transition matrix gets a bit heavier, but uh, this is something we can define theoretically. Um, and we can go a step further and say, instead of just considering the coalescing times, i.e. the height of these trees, which is what PSMC does, we can introduce another state, which is the lineage path, i.e. the path paths through which um, the paths that a lineage took before it coalesced. For example, this is path AB because you have one lineage through A and one through B. And this is path BB where we have two lineages through B. So uh, we introduced a new Hida Markov model, which I call the structured pairwise sequentially Markovian coalescent SPSMC. And as we get on to the kind of primary goal of this is, is demographic inference to infer a model. Uh, but we can do these nice things where we can kind of decode the hidden Markov model and look at the probability of being in each state. So on the plot here is a kind of PSMC plot where we can infer the coalescing time, uh, the simulation given in blue and the kind of level of certainty given in the highlighted regions. And with our new hidden Markov model, we can also infer uh, the hidden state at each time, which is kind of see this washboard effect if you expand the state space. And by simply marginalizing over the different possible paths, we can do this nice thing where we try and identify the regions of the genome that come from our admixed population. So this plot here is from the, uh, is from the simulation and this plot here is from um, marginalizing over our posterior state vector. And I think you can see that we seem to have a lot of power to infer these regions. So uh, going back to our kind of par uh, parametric model inference, uh, we look to infer the population size changes, the split fraction and the split time. And also, um, yes. So how well can we do this? Well, we can ask a series of questions such as if we're given the correct uh, split and rejoin times, how well can we infer the population size change parameters? So we simulate a model where we have a split and then one of our populations B changes size dramatically given by this kind of green line. And uh, what we found is that SPSMC doesn't seem to be able to distinguish changes in A from changes in B, uh, but it does seem to be able to infer this gamma fraction very accurately. So we kind of make a further constraint where we assume that population B is the same size for this period, which is unlikely to be true, but I believe it gives us more power to infer the changes in population size A. And if we do this, so here's a model that, uh, this is a simulation where a model uh, has this, some kind of bottleneck and then a recovery, and there's some kind of uh, structure here where there's a split time and rejoin. I believe we have a lot of power to infer the correct population size changes and also we have a lot of power to infer the correct split fraction. So finally we can think about how well can we infer the split times. Well because we're working in a discrete hit a Markov model we have some different number of time intervals. Um, so what we can do is we can search every single possible pair as given in this matrix and we can record the likelihood uh, for this model. So if we trade over all the pairs, uh, we can record the final log likelihood after a convergence. And uh, what we found is there's kind of this high region of uh, likelihood and the true pairs given by this white cell. Uh, so in summary, I believe that we have a lot of power to infer this as well. And the kind of key question that we're trying to answer is whether a history would be panmictic or structured. Um, so to answer this question, we again did some more simulations where we have a certain curve given by this gray line and we generate this coalescent rate for a structured population or a panmixic population. And we find if panmixia is the simulation, then we can try and fit this with a structured model. And to determine how well we are able to do this, we look at the difference in the log likelihood or like a likelihood ratio or difference in log likelihood. And we find generally that the, uh, the, the structured model isn't able to beat panmixia in a lot of cases. I mean, sometimes, but only marginally by a few units of log, of log likelihood. And then if our simulation is structured, then uh, it seems that we have a lot of good evidence to, to distinguish this because the, the difference in log likelihood is, um, is more significant than we see if panmixic is true. Uh, 
So uh, I believe that we have some, some power to infer structure. And if we do this, we kind of have a load of candidate models that might be fitting the data better. In this plot here, we have uh, the panmictic inference given in this orange line and a series of structured inferences for different TS and TE pairs given by these other colors. So we kind of need to be careful in choosing which model we think is the most accurate. Okay, so we apply our method on uh, the HGDP data set, which is a data set of about 900 individuals um, of different ancestry. And just as a reminder, we only have one diploid sample from each population. So we've taken a few different diverse uh, populations, for example, Yoruba from Nigeria and San from Southern, Southern Africa. Then there's a Papuan from South Asia and, uh, and a couple of European samples and a Pakistani, Rahui individual. So the first thing to do is run a panmictic inference plot on this, i.e. a classic PSMC. And what we see is kind of familiar, i.e. we get this out of Africa bottleneck for the non-African populations. Um, and then we see not such a severe increase in population size in San individuals or Yoruba individuals. And to kind of date another couple of, um, of events in human evolutionary history, uh, the estimated split time with the Neanderthals is somewhere around here, 600,000 years ago. And at about 300,000 years ago, uh, we see the, uh, the onset of anatomically modern humans. So uh, essentially what I think people would call homo sapiens somewhere around this point. This is given by some fossil evidence in, in Morocco. So if we apply SPSMC on this, what do we find? Um, in summary, I believe that we have found a lot of strong evidence for some structure in diverse populations. Uh, for example, if we look at the sand individual to start with, uh, the, the inferred split time would be just over 1 million years ago, and a rejoin time of somewhere between 100 and 200,000 years ago, and the admixture fraction being about 10%, somewhere around this. And we find very similar uh, results for other populations, such as this Yoruba individual, very similar split and rejoin time, similar admixture fraction. And in our French individual, again, very similar uh, split and rejoin times, except from I think the split time is slightly more recent. And finally, in our Papuan individual, we uh, see even more recent rejoin time, but a very similar split time and a slightly higher gamma. So a high number of, uh, high percentage of individuals who have integrated into that population. And the kind of thing we're working on at the moment is we see these really significant likelihood scores. Before we had about 20 or 30 or 10. So we need to think about how we can explain such a significant difference in, um, which is suggesting that structure is more true or is more closely, it's closer to the truth. So to kind of summarize, we have this new method to uh, develop split times and population size changes. And um, we call this SPSMC. And the evidence that we find is that all the human population we've analyzed, uh, we can explain some of their ancestry components with these ghost archaic common integration events where we split about 1 million years ago and rejoin somewhere around 100,000 years ago. And the admixture we find is somewhere between 10 and 30%. And to kind of synthesize this with some other results, there's this recent paper from Aaron Ragsdale, and they find a similar thing where there's some ancestral populations of humans with splits around a million years ago. And then these archaic hominins for which we have no data, uh, they make up quite a significant amount of ancestry in all these different uh, human populations. And, and the kind of interesting thing is the split that we've inferred is before the split of Neanderthals and humans and dense ovens. So this, this kind of, some people might call it a, a super archaic lineage um, because we don't have any data for it and it seems to be in the order of one million years ago. Oh, and finally, there's been some other authors who demonstrate these signals and all of which use different methods. So um, ours is another one that adds to that catalog, essentially. <laughs> uh, just to finish off, I just want to say thank you to uh, the Mathematical Genomics Medicine Program in Cambridge, my advisors, Aylan Scali, Richard Durbin, and people in the Durban group, Scali group, especially Regev, who's been particularly helpful. So, thank you. Questions? Chris? Thank you, Trevor. It's a great talk. Oh. Easier if I do that. Um, just totally naive question. Why are you focusing on using a single individual to infer this? Why wouldn't you want to use a population? Yeah, good question. Um, so, you know, 10 years ago when we only had one 
or a few samples of different people, that would have been a good method. Uh, now we have uh, lots of different individuals from lots of different populations, so you could argue that um, making a method that uses more is a fine thing to do. And I mean, the method that we have can use more than one, just use the same individual from the same sample and you have more power to detect these parameters. Um, but one individual is kind of important because in these ghost populations, which I'm kind of pointing to here, we, we don't have any information from them. So being able to detect this event from just one individual is quite a nice thing. And secondarily, um, you know, I'm talking about humans here, but I'm working with the Tree of Life and Sanger where there's all these different species of animals and you know for a lot of these species we only have one sequence so this is just an application with humans but I hope to apply it on other species as well. Great, thank you. So, so here you're using sequencing data for, for, for all of these? Whole genome sequence, sequence data, sequence. yeah. And are the software available? Uh, it could be, I could press publish on GitHub but I'm trying to tidy it up a bit first. <laughs> So we have a question on Zoom from Stefan. How is your model protected from constantly detecting very small split events? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I think the short answer is that we're probably not detecting those things. Um, but, you know, the original publication PSMC is just looking for a panmictic event. And my defense is that we're slightly moving closer to the truth by detecting these big events. Um, and yes, it is probably likely there are these other events like ongoing gene flow between other populations. But um, yeah, the model we're using is just assuming there's one big event and I think that we have power to detect that. And from one sequence, we probably don't have power to detect these smaller events, but uh, there are other methods that can, that can do that. Maybe a final question for me. So, so you, you said that you are distinguishing between the two models, the pandemic and the structure model using kind of the difference in the likelihood mm -hmm. of the, usually your simulations is there a, i guess kind of in real using real data kind of is there a level where you recommend kind of someone should be level of difference that someone should be using in practice yeah good question this is the kind of thing uh, we need to think about before we before we write it up i um, mean initially when we tried to do this we did you know the classic null hypothesis being the panmatic model um and what's the and the like an inferring structure model and how can we you know reject the null hypothesis or whatever but we did a load of simulation and learning the test statistic i.e the likelihood ratio the distribution of that was quite difficult i spent a lot of uh, compute hours trying to learn that distribution but it wasn't quite clear and it's you know this distribution is going to be dependent upon your population parameters so okay. um yeah so i think it depends on the sequence length and other things like that great thank you very much Trevor. So next we have a virtual presentation from uh, Cathal Ormond from Trinity College Dublin. So uh, while it's been set up, the title of the presentation is uh, A Bayesian Framework to Model Cost Segregation in Pedigrees Using Next Generation Sequencing Data. So, so Cathal, the, the floor is yours. We can see your slides. Great. Hi. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, yes we can. Great. Thanks very much. So thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Cahill. I'm a final year PhD student in Trinity College Dublin, and uh, as, uh, I'm going to present part of my PhD work on a Bayesian framework to model co-segregation in pedigrees using next generation sequencing data. So I guess, as most people might be familiar with, linkage analysis is a great tool that a lot of people can use to analyze pedigree data. But as is often the case when we work with next generation sequencing and data, our sample sizes often aren't sufficient to run linkage analysis. So a common alternative that people apply is what I'm referring here as an identity by state uh, filtering analysis. So we might uh, prioritize variants that are present in all affected individuals in our pedigrees and absent from all unaffected individuals. And this analysis strategy is widely used, but I guess because now we're using a non-statistical approach, we kind of um, we lose a bit of information about how much a, a variant is uh, interesting relative to its cost segregation. And also this idea of requiring everyone to carry the variant might work well for Mendelian phenotypes, but I guess it's not as uh, straightforward how to relax it for complex phenotypes where we might have reduced penetrance or phenocopy rates. So I'll chat a little bit in the coming slides on some strategies for um, relaxing this, but once we have our variants uh, prioritized based on our co-segregation, we can also prioritize them based on metrics like allele frequency and functional consequence and deleteriousness. Um, for example, we're interested in rare variants, and a common threshold people might take is 1%, um, so allele frequency less than 1%, but 
an issue with this is, you know, sometimes you can make an, a, an argument for taking half a percent, 0.1 percent, relaxing it to 5 percent. So while these cutoff thresholds might be guided by empirical evidence, they're often arbitrary and we might exclude variants based on slightly above threshold or sub threshold values, um, which might not be the best uh, method or might throw out variants that would actually be interesting. So I'm going to talk briefly about a motivating example, kind of an analysis my research group performed previously that kind of guided why we decided to develop a new model. So we examined whole genome sequencing data from six pedigrees that were affected by schizophrenia. Uh, we focused in on family private variants from about 36 individuals. And as I said, we we're interested in rare variants with an assumed dominant effect. So we specified two co-segregation patterns. Uh, the first is our full co-segregation, like we said before, look at variants present in all affected individuals and absent from unaffected. And then we relax it by allowing one of the unaffected or one of the affected individuals not to carry the variant. So this kind of makes sense for the pedigrees we have based on the sample size, but it doesn't really generalize quite well. It doesn't take into account where in the pedigree this uh, unaffected individual falls or um, how many, if, what proportion of individuals are affected versus unaffected. So recently the schizophrenia exome meta-analysis or schema consortium um, prioritized or showed an enrichment of certain classes of rare protein coding variants in schizophrenia. So to take a variant level prioritization, we just applied the same uh, filters see if there was anything with a predicted strong effect coming up. And we identified that there were three variants in three pedigrees that were quite interesting that had a reduced co-segregation pattern. So just to show some uh, the pedigrees quite briefly, um, here is one of our pedigrees. Individuals in black are affected with schizophrenia. The individuals in marked with green were sequenced. And they're showing our um, carrier status underneath. So we have that this one individual on the far left is affected but doesn't carry the variant, whereas the other three or the four rather affected individuals do carry the variant. So it's an interesting co-segregation pattern within this pedigree where linkage analysis couldn't have uh, been identified or couldn't have been applied rather. And we saw a similar pattern in our other two pedigrees where we found a variant of interest. But again, part of the issue here is we don't really have any, because we're using a non-statistical approach, we've kind of lost this kind of quantitative measure of how much information is contained in one pedigree relative to another. And also our filtering, our co-segregation and our variant level filters are independent of one another. So this kind of motivated us to develop a more unified framework where we could quantitatively measure our co-segregation in our smaller pedigrees, but also integrate our variant level co-segregation or our variant level um, metrics. So to give a, a very quick overview of our Bayesian framework, we, for a given uh, input variant, um, we consider two alternative or complementary models where the variant is assumed to contribute to the phenotype versus it's assumed to be independent of the phenotype. And what we're looking to calculate here is our posterior odds of causality. So the ratio of the probabilities of our model given our input data. And we can calculate this uh, as our Bayes factor multiplied by our prior odds for causality. So this posterior odds of causality is what we're going to use as our main uh, metric to rank or prioritize our variance. And it's going to encompass our co-segregation metric in our, as a, a Bayes factor. And we can include and integrate our variant level prioritization metrics in our prior odds. So first I'll talk a little bit about our Bayes factor, how we calculate it and the assumptions we make. Um, so we extended uh, some previous work by Mahamadi et al who considered a likelihood ratio. So we just reconfigured this um, calculation to calculate a Bayes factor looking at the ratio of the likelihoods of our two models. Um, Mahamadi et al uh, discussed some strategies for how to prioritize our variants um, if they're assumed to be rare in the general population. So if we have this pedigree here on the right, assuming that the variant is quite rare, it's extremely unlikely that it entered the pedigree through two different uh, independent routes. So I guess we can assume that our rare variants only uh, enter our pedigree through one independent founder. So this reduces our search space for um, phenotype configurations that we may or may not uh, find interesting in the pedigree. Um, so a couple of bits about the components of our model. Our fixed quantities are our data. So we have our observed genotypes, the individuals we've sequenced, and the pedigree ph uh, phenotypes. And some of the parameters in the model are unknown genotypes, so we can actually incorporate all other individuals in the pedigree um, whose genotypes will be distributed according to Mendel's laws. Um, we assume that there's a proband, so an affected variant carrier, so the variant is present in at least one affected individual, otherwise it's less interesting. Um, beta here is our in-family penetrance, which we, is our the probability of having the phenotype for our carriers. Uh, phi is our phenocopy rate, the probability of having the phenotype for non-carriers, specifically within the pedigree. And then our alpha is our phenotype incidence rate, so the population uh, uh, incidence rate. So the assumptions we make to calculate our Bayes model are quite stripped back. Uh, like we said, we assume the variant is rare in the general population. 
Our causal variant is assumed to have a dominant effect on the phenotype and our neutral variant will have an independent effect on the phenotype. So under these assumptions, we can actually come up with some relations between our parameters. So for a causal variant, we assume that having the variant will increase your probability of the phenotype compared to not having the variant. So that means our beta term should always be greater than our phi for a causal model. And if the variant is independent of the phenotype, then having it or not having it shouldn't make any difference. So our phi and beta should be equal to one another. So how we calculate our, uh, our likelihood of the causal model, um, we marginalize over our um, parameters and we, with a little bit of algebra, we can just break this down into uh, a couple of uh, separate terms. So the first, we need to look at the probability of all the phenotypes in the pedigree conditional on the genotypes. Now, since our variant is assumed to have a dominant effect, we can actually look at this on a per individual basis and say that the probability of an individual having the, uh, the phenotype will be conditional only or depend only on their own genotype and not on the genotypes or phenotypes of anyone else in the pedigree. So you can break this down as just a product of our beta and our phi terms um, for our uh, carriers and non-carriers separately. The next term in our likelihood uh, is just the inheritance probability. So what's the probability of observing this particular genotype configuration, given that the variant exists in the pedigree? Um, and that's given for autosomal variants, it's just a half to the power of the number of times the variant is or isn't transmitted from a parent who carries the variant. So that's just straight up uh, Mendelian segregation. And then the last term in our, in our uh, likelihood calculation is the prior distribution for our parameters phi and beta. So what we thought was a reasonable prior, uh, prior distribution was that it's more likely a variant has a high penetrance or a higher penetrance, and it's likely that it has a lower phenocopy rate if it has a, a, if it has a dominant effect on the phenotype. So that's what we have here, a somewhat like a linear or maybe piecewise linear prior distribution for this phi and beta. And I have this cutoff here just to represent the fact that um, our phi term is going to be bounded above by our beta, whatever value of uh, beta we take. So that's uh, our likelihood for our causal model. For the neutral model, it behaves almost identically. Um, the only difference here is that the phenotype term, now we don't have any genotypes. So the way we calculated this was by just looking at the per individual probability of having the phenotype, which uh, comes back down to our population incidence rate. So it's a little bit of a, uh, the assumptions we make are um, a little bit strong here, but it does allow us to, um, a nice, simple, uh, straightforward calculation. Um, our inheritance term is calculated as above, and just to keep things straightforward, we took the uniform prior for this alpha term, the population instance rate. So what this results in having a base factor uh, that we've calculated that it has entirely closed form solution, and it just it depends solely on tabulating um, our affection status with our carrier status. So we look at the number of affected carriers, affected non-carriers, and the same for unaffected individuals. And those counts will uniquely determine our base factor in our nice closed form. So once we have our Bayes factor, we can go on and, and separately look at calculating a prior odds for causality. So to do this, uh, since we're looking for variants with dominant effect, we examined protein coding variants from ClinVar to try and see if we could learn some of the characteristics of these variants that might help, uh, help us discriminate between um, different classes. And specifically, the two classes we're looking at were benign or likely benign variants on one side and pathogenic or likely pathogenic variants on the other side. And they required that there had to be no comp for the variants of interest, no conflicts of submission. They were submitted by multiple individuals. So we had just over uh, 76,000 variants, 16,000 odd pathogenic and nearly 60,000 benign variants that we used um, to see if, what, uh, if we could learn some properties about them that might help us discriminate um, or get generate a prior odds for causality. So to keep consistent with our previous analysis, given that we were interested in schizophrenia, we look, we select priority or selected predictors rather that um, had been used during the schema meta-analysis. So specifically, we looked at allele frequency, the maximum allele frequency across uh, ancestry groups in NOMAD, the functional consequence of the variant, whether it was an intronic variant, a UTR, a frame shift variant, et cetera. And specifically for missense variants, the MPC deleteriousness score, um, which is supposed to rank um, missense variants from zero to score zero to five. So to classify the clinical significance of the variants, we just uh, applied a simple logistic regression model um, to just try and determine if we could predict variants were pathogenic or benign. Um, we assumed that the variants, uh, di variants of different type would behave differently. So we trained three independent models, uh, Indels, missense variants, and everything else. So after running these models and generating regression coefficients, we can use these regression coefficients to generate a prior probability of that the variant looks like it's pathogenic in ClinVar, which we use as our prior probability for causality. 
So as a sanity check, we applied this to all the benign variants and all the pathogenic variants in ClinVar to see what the distribution would be like. But also we extracted from ClinVar variants of unknown significance. So these variants should have a little bit more of a mixed message. They don't have a clear evidence of, of clinical significance. And here I'm showing you dense or box plots for the different classes of variants uh, with the prior uh, probability of causality. So you can see that benign variants in the green here have quite a low or by and large have a quite a low prior probability of causality. Pathogenic variants have quite high probability of causality. And then the variants of unknown significance in blue are somewhere in the middle, uh, but tending towards the lower end of the scale, which is kind of what we expected. So we have a base factor calculation. We have a prior odds for causalities. We can combine these two now and return to our pedigrees and our whole genome sequencing data. So we applied the model to the three pedigrees and the aim was to see how well each the model did at finding the variants had been prioritized by the filtering method before. So in the interest of time, I'll just chat through one of the pedigrees, but the one with the most information. So in the table above here, I'm showing you the base factor and its rank, the prior probability for causality and the posterior probability for causality and its rank. So out of a subset of 55,000 variants in constrained genes, we found that our variant ranked fourth. It had a, prior prob a posterior probability of causality of over 99%, which is quite good. Uh, we can see that the base factor ranked moderately compared to all variants, but we knew that given this was a reduced co-segregation pattern, it wasn't going to rank the highest. So we're pretty happy with this. Our model seemed to uh, perform relatively favorably at identifying this uh, filtering and filtered uh, variant. And for the other two pedigrees, it also performed the same. The filtered variant was in the top three or top four variants in both cases. But we're interested also if we expanded the model a bit, what other variants that had similar posteriors, slightly higher, slightly lower, would have been found in the model? So again, for this pedigree, we examined uh, the top 10 variants ranked by the posterior. So apologies, there's a lot of text on this slide here. But just to pull out a couple of things, um, you can see that the prior here um, is relatively high for a lot of the variants. Um, if we look at our variant, we can see the prior is 97%, but it actually does go a bit higher for other variants. And the reason why some variants ranked quite higher is because that the functional consequences for these tended to be quite specific or quite well defined in ClinVar. So frame shift, so rare frame shift and stop gain variants were almost exclusively pathogenic in ClinVar. So this was what was driving this quite high prior, which is what resulted in our, our missense variant not ranking quite as high as the other, given that missense variants have a bit less of a clear information. So Another variant that we thought was quite interesting in this pedigree, in this the top ten, I have um, I've highlighted here the variant that ranked number seven. We can see the posterior probability is still quite high; it's all over ninety nine percent, and it's, it's quite similar to the uh, variant from our filtering analysis. Um, but what's interesting is you can see the base factor is actually it's ranked the base factor is ranked first amongst all variants. It was a variant that had perfect co segregation in this pedigree. But I guess what's most interesting about this new frame shift variant was that. Uh, we found uh, in a separate study that there was a sequencing study looking at um, a pedigree with a uh, pedigree with schizophrenia, and they also identified the exact same gene that this frame shift variant is contained in as likely the causal gene in this pedigree for schizophrenia. So this frame shift variant is rare in the general population, but the minor allele count, which is shown here, is too high to have been included by the scheme analysis. So our schema-based filtering analysis would have excluded this variant because it, although it's rare, it's not sufficiently rare for the hard threshold. Whereas our analysis now can actually reclaim this in some way, and we can see that it's uh, it actually should have been retained, um, and it, it's quite interesting to the pedigree. It's quite interesting to the phenotype um, that we we're, we're interested in. So I thought this is quite interesting that you know these kind of hard thresholds or these hard filters, while they make sense in a lot of ways, you know, there's just some things that are slightly sub threshold can get kicked out, and um, when really uh, maybe a more nuanced approach might be a bit more appropriate. So a couple of factors, I guess the uh, base factor will, like all things, be limited by the number of individuals we have sequenced in a pedigree. Um, although in our example, we were looking at family private variants as a first pass analysis. But if we had base factors calculated for the same variant across multiple independent pedigrees, we could combine and multiply these base factors so that we would kind of gain the advantage of um, using multiple, in, uh, multiple independent pedigrees. Um, as we noted, the ClinVar variants might not be the best choice for schizophrenia, given that certain class of variants are almost exclusively always pathogenic. So it mightn't be good for the specific phenotypes, so maybe a more uh, a database that's more tailored to our phenotype might have been more useful. But I guess it works quite well for general methods if you want to have just a general prior probability that a variant is uh, disease causing. And finally, one part of the scheme of filtering analysis was to prioritize um, genes based on their constraint scores, the PLI scores. Um, so this is something that we couldn't integrate into our regression model because we were looking at variant level metrics. 
But going forward, it's kind of something that we would like to integrate to maybe come up with a gene level base factor score and it, so that we can incorporate this so we can get the full weight of the model. So just to summarize, we've created a new measure of co-segregation in terms of our base factor, which we can integrate with our variant level metrics to get a prior or posterior probability of causality that's uh, quite interpretable from our Bayesian framework. Our model uh, that's based on the schema prioritization does quite well at identifying variants from uh, the filtering analysis. And additionally, we find other variants that the hard filters would have kicked out that actually we could reclaim by using our, um, our new model. So with that, I would like to thank very much my supervisors, our collaborators, I acknowledge my funders, and thank you all for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. That's a great talk. Thank you, Cathal. So questions from the audience? So maybe I can start while everyone else is uh, thinking. So if I understand well, you make some prior assumptions on the on the penetrance function that you use in your co-segregation analysis uh, model. So, uh, do you know how sensitive kind of your uh, results would be kind of under different assumptions of, on kind of the the risks that you're assuming for your in, in, in your penetrance function, uh, yeah. which may not be known in advance. I guess kind of in, in most cases. Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, we compared it to, say, a uniform model, um, which is, you know, the least uh, least informative model. Um, and we found that variants that had what we could, off the off the face, would think have a better co-segregation pattern purely by looking at the pedigree seemed to perform better under our new um, linear model by upweighting variants with a higher penetrance. Um, I guess part of the model, part of the problem with the model is that to keep things nice and straightforward, we had to assume our restrictions based on our, our penetrance parameter have to be restrictive. Something a bit more likely might be to take, take a beta prior, something that gives you a bit more control. Um, but the beta prior is kind of made, um, uh, the beta prior is required that we didn't have a closed form solution for our base factor. So we kept it a bit more straightforward. Um, ideally, we'd like to have as much control as possible um, for these in family penetrance and in family phenocopy rates. Um, but the only ones we tested were, like I said, the uniform prior to this slightly more weighted linear prior. Um, and I did find that changing from one to the other did give us kind of a better handle or a upweight variance that had um, on the face with better co-segregation patterns. Okay. Have two questions from the audience. Uh, hi, Carl. Um, Jerome Breen, King's College London. Um, the, um, I just wondered if you had integrated or tried to integrate polygenic risk score into your model. Or something, or something a little bit related, which is like how old someone is relative to the age of onset liability distribution. Sure. So, um, in terms of polygenic risk score, no, we haven't yet. Although that's, I, that's, uh, I think, would be really useful because I guess you know we talk about the penetrance. What I say is the penetrance is really the family specific, and there will be family modula modulating factors such as polygenic risk. So, not yet, but that'd be a really interesting thing to try and integrate. Um, and then your second point, uh, I'm afraid I've forgotten what your second uh, second question had. Oh, sorry, the age of onset, the age of specific effect, sorry. Um, yeah, so the original Mahamadi paper, which was derived for cancer genomics, specifically breast cancer genomics, um, incorporated age of onset. And I guess for schizophrenia, it's probably quite interesting. And that's a limitation we have at the moment that individuals who carry the variant who might be too young to have it or present like there's some kind of discordance. So um, yeah, it's something that we would love to try and integrate and get more uh, more updated information on because I think that's something that would really kind of help um, for age specific phenotypes. So, okay, so we have a question on Zoom from Clive. Um, have you tried to calibrate your posterior probabilities? Yeah, so I guess we. Um, one thing which you probably noticed is that the prior probabilities are quite strong in a lot of ways. So it, this is kind of reflected by the fact that some variants with modest based factors or, you know, not very you know, base factors less than one are actually ranking quite higher. So what we would like to do is kind of have a, you know, have a, re, uh, a nice distribution that we can expect for our base factors, a nice distribution for priors, and then be able to come up with like a nice cutoff that we could say, okay, variants with a prior, posterior greater than a certain value are the ones we can uh, we can prioritize. So at the moment, we don't have anything. It's just really looking at the ranking, which is not the best. But ultimately, sure, that's where we'd like to go to actually say that, give a nice cutoff threshold for this interpretable metric of a posterior probability. That's great. Thank you very much. I'm afraid we have to leave it uh, here. So thank you very much again, uh, Catherine. Thank you. So
<laughs> the last speaker in uh, this session is uh, Heather Cotel from Newcastle University, and the title of her presentation is Quantifying the Evidence of Pathogenicity in the Context of Digenic Inheritance with Respect to a Skeletal Mass Myopathy Phenotype. So, thank you. Quite sure what I'm supposed to do here to get uh, my slides up and get myself off off Zoom or anything. Am I supposed to do something here, or are you all doing it at the back? <laughs> Thank you. That's not my talk. Uh, where's your... I don't know where my talk is. It'll be in the folder that was set up, I guess, for this session. Cordell. Great, uh, thanks very much. Uh, so this is uh, joint work uh, with some collaborators from Newcastle and also some collaborators from outside Newcastle. Uh, so back in September 2020, uh, one of my colleagues from Newcastle approached me via Zoom uh, with the following request. They had performed whole exome sequencing on a set of pedigrees exhibiting a skeletal muscle myopathy phenotype. Uh, and as is usual in their lab, they had searched for rare damaging variants in a panel of known or candidate genes, and they'd found that deleterious variants at a particular X-linked gene, SRPK3, appeared to segregate with disease. However, the story was a little bit more complicated. Although all the diseased individuals did indeed have deleterious variants in this gene, not all individuals with rare deleterious variants in the gene had the disease. In other words, um, these variants seem to be necessary but not sufficient for disease development. Now, two of the pedigrees contain members with a different phenotype, an isolated dilated cardiomyopathy, and this cardiomyopathy appeared to be segregating with a separate gene, a, a dominantly inherited truncating variant in a gene called Titan. Um, and this is a gene that's known to be involved with um, a spectrum of skeletal and cardiac phenotypes. So uh, when they screened the Titan gene in the larger set of pedigrees, um, they found that all the index skeletal muscle myopathy cases, so that's the original phenotype that they were interested in, um, in addition to having a rare deleterious variant in the X-linked gene that they found originally, also carried heterozygous deletions in um, the Titan gene. Uh, this is a picture of the pedigrees. Um, so the key thing here, as you can see, we've got some small pedigrees and we've got some larger pedigrees, uh, but all the individuals who are affected, so shown in black, have got both um, uh, an X-linked SRPK3 variant and a Titan variant, uh, shown as a T, and uh, typically individuals who've only got one of these variants uh, do not have the disease. Okay, so we seem to be in a situation where diagenic inheritance, whereby deleterious variants of both of these genes are required um, uh, for disease development, and that would seem to explain the data, but not quite. Um, if you looked more closely at the figure that I took away very quickly, uh, you'll see that um, there was one family that had several individuals who did have um, variants in both genes, but who are unaffected with disease. Uh, and the single affected individual in this family had a separate second Titan variant. So individuals in that family who only had one of the Titan variants were unaffected, even if they had the SRPK3 variant. In addition, there were four females in other families who had deleterious variants at both genes, but again were unaffected. Uh, when my collaborators went and did some experimental work, they found that these females had so-called random X inactivation. Um, so my understanding, this is kind of 50% inactive and 50% non-inactive, so active uh, deleterious um, alleles. 
And so the explanation that they came up with is perhaps the functional wild type allele is compensating for the deleterious allele in these individuals, which is why they don't get the disease. Uh, separately, there were two females um, who had variants in both genes who were affected, and they had a different pattern of X inactivation. They had so-called skewed X inactivation, um, which my understanding means that one X, home, X chromosome is mostly inactive. And from this assay, they don't know which chromosome is inactive. Um, but because these individuals are affected, the explanation is that it's the uh, wild type allele that's inactive. And so it's the deleterious allele that's operating. And therefore, these individuals get the disease. OK, so we've got the situation where diagenic inheritance, whereby you need deleterious variants at both genes um, to get the disease, seems to explain the data, but with a few complicating um, issues. And so the question that my uh, colleagues were asking me is, what is the probability of seeing this pattern of data if, in fact, another explanation is true? Um, if, for example, uh, just the original X-linked gene alone is involved, perhaps with reduced penetrance, explaining why not everyone who has it gets the disease. Um, or perhaps this other gene, Titan, alone is involved, again, perhaps with reduced penetrance. OK, so addressing this question um, and trying to calculate this probability is very reminiscent um, of the calculations that people carried out from the 1980s um, onwards. And some of us who got into the field in the 1990s carried out uh, to do parametric uh, linkage analysis. So this is where you're trying to calculate the likelihood of genetic data measured in pedigrees under various hypotheses, but primarily trying to test the null hypothesis that the recombination fraction theta between some measured marker locus that you've genotyped and some hypothetical disease locus um, is equal to a half or not. Uh, now, in fact, others have used parametric linkage analysis to address questions about um, causality of sequence variants. And in particular, uh, from a paper nearly uh, 20 years ago, Deborah Thompson and colleagues uh, tried to do exactly that. They proposed a method that examined co-segregation of a variant uh, with disease in affected carrier families. Uh, and they used the linkage package to calculate the full pedigree likelihood. And the specific likelihood ratio or Bayes factor that they proposed um, was this thing here. And so what we're essentially basing the, the inference on is the likelihood of the vector of variant genotypes in a family, uh, given the vector of disease phenotypes in the family, given the variant genotype of the proband that caused the family to come into the study, uh, and then this is calculated um, on the top, conditional on the fact that the variant is disease causing, or on the bottom, uh, conditional on the fact that the variant is neutral. And so this is your Bayes factor or likelihood ratio for causality of the variant. Um, now, uh, the authors noted that the likelihoods uh, in the numerator and denominator um, of this can be calculated using standard methods of parametric linkage analysis, assuming a two allele model where you have a hypothetical susceptibility locus with a disease allele, which I'll call big A, which corresponds to all deleterious alleles, and a normal allele, which I'll call little a, which corresponds to all neutral alleles. And then um, this, this event of the, of the, the measured variant being uh, causal can be modeled by treating the measured variant as a genetic marker allele that's in complete linkage and complete LD with this hypothetical uh, susceptibility allele. Uh, and the event of the, the measured variant being neutral can be modeled by assuming independent segregation. So assuming the measured variant um, has basically recombination fraction a half and um, no LD with the underlying hypothetical susceptibility allele. OK, so this um, Bayes factor can be further um, expanded out as shown here. And the point of doing this is the term on the left um, is the anti-log of the standard LOD score for linkage, uh, which you would get out of a linkage analysis program uh, between the measured variant um, and disease, assuming complete LD between the variant and the hypothetical susceptibility limit. The term on the right is basically very similar, but it is essentially written in terms of just the genotype variants of the proband rather than the, the uh, genotype data of the full family. And essentially, it's a correction for the fact that the probond is known to car carry the variant. So the idea is we don't use the information from the proband. We're only really looking at the information from the rest of the family. And both of these terms can be calculated using standard linkage analysis software, uh, such as the linkage programs. Now, remember, we've actually got two genes that we're interested in. We've got this X-link gene, SRPK3, and we've got Titan. Uh, now, the linkage package has previously been extended to perform two locus linkage analysis. 
Um, but the resulting software doesn't seem to have been made widely available. And moreover, its primary focus, which is about testing the null hypothesis of no linkage at either locus, isn't really the main hypothesis that we're interested in. It doesn't really match our question. We did explore another uh, package which has been developed for two-locus linkage analysis. That's the Gene Hunter two-locus uh, program. It's got a similar limitation regarding the null hypothesis. It's also got some additional undesirable features. It's not designed to incorporate X-linked loci. It doesn't allow for LD between the marker and um, the hypothetical disease alleles. It doesn't allow for varying liability classes, which is something we're going to use uh, later on. And uh, for those of you who know what this means, it uses the Lander Green algorithm rather than the Elston Stewart algorithm, which means it's computationally prohibitive for some of our larger pedigrees. So instead of using either of those programs, we instead uh, chose to go back and follow uh, the approach of Deborah Thompson and colleagues using the M-Link program from the linkage package. Um, but taking advantage of its ability to incorporate liability classes in order to model some of the complicating features in our data set, in, in particular, the complicating feature of trying to, to look at two loci. Um, and so the way we did this is we analysed um, each of the loci, each of the genes separately, um, but assigning individuals to different liability classes, whereby their genotype-specific penetrance is at the test locus, whichever one we were testing at that time, could vary according to the genotype at the other conditioning locus. Um, and potentially on other factors, such as the presence of an additional Titan variant in family 18, which seemed to need that, um, and or the possible X inactivation at SRPK3. Um, now this, if you remember, uh, was the likelihood ratio uh, proposed by Thompson et al. We chose to focus uh, primarily on the likelihood ratio, um, or the term here, on the left of this. Um, and so that's basically using all of the data in, in the pedigree. And so it's incorporating rather than correcting for the evidence from the proband. And this struck us as being more in the spirit of the way that people do things nowadays when you're trying to look at uh, causality of sequence variants. You tend to use everyone. You don't condition on, on the proband that brought the family into your attention. In particular, if you cast your mind back to the pedigrees I showed you, quite a lot of those pedigrees only had one proband. So if we didn't use those, uh, we would lose a lot of information. Okay, so we proposed um, eight different uh, analysis models, uh, which I've tried to color code here. Um, so the ones in green are the ones that we think are going to fit the data quite well, because they involve um, both, uh, both genes. Uh, we'll only be analyzing one gene at a time, but we'll be using the uh, liability classes to model the effect of the other gene. And they mostly vary according to whether family 18 is or is not included, and if it is included, whether we model the effect of this extra Titan variant. Uh, the models marked in red are the ones that a priori we don't expect to fit the data very well because they're only modeling uh, the, the situation where one gene, the gene that's being tested, is actually having an effect. And we kind of already know that's not going to work very well. Um, these models here shown in amber also only model the effect of only one gene having effect, but we allow it to have reduced penetrance. And so it actually may fit the data okay because that will explain why not everyone who has the variant appears to get the disease. Just to make it even more complicated, uh, these three models here had two different versions, which we called submodels A and B, um, which were relevant for individuals who are not actually genotyped at the conditioning locus, and therefore whose genotype-specific penetrances for the liability class um, were not defined. Uh, I haven't got time in to, get, to go into the details of this. Feel free to catch me later if you want more details. Uh, so all of these models were fitted twice, once assuming complete LD and once assuming no LD between the tested variant and the hypothetical susceptibility allele. Okay, so I'll just go into a little bit more detail about one of the models. Um, we've got tables like this for all eight of those models and their submodels. So this is model 3A applied to Titan. And so here's the description. The idea is that an SRPK3 variant needs to be present in order for Titan to have non-negligible penetrance. Um, we also do something about trying to model XN activation. And we also do something about trying to model the effect of another Titan variant in family 18. And so in this model, we ended up with four different liability classes. And so, for example, individuals who don't have any SRPK3 variants present, who've been measured but who don't have them, um, or females who do have an SRPK3 variant and random X inactivation, essentially they, they have very little chance of getting the disease. Their penetrances are, are sort of negligible, regardless of what their genotype is at the test locus. Whereas males, for example, who do have an SRPK3 variant, and if a member of family 18 also have additional Titan variant, then they essentially have a kind of dominant model uh, in terms of what's happening at Titan. 
Um, and I haven't got time to go into the other uh, classes or the other models, but essentially we tried to come up with a model for um, a liability classes um, that would fit with the models we were trying to do for all of the other proposed models. Um, okay, so here's the results in terms of the, the LOD scores we got when we analysed SRPK3. I'm not expecting you to be able to read all the numbers in this table or even to want to read the numbers in this table, uh, but I'll just try and orient you. So the, the top half of the table is all the LOD scores that were calculated under, under complete LD, and the bottom half um, is all the ones that were calculated under no LD between the measured variant and the hypothetical susceptibility allele. Um, and so the first thing to note is that really all of the numbers in the top half of the table are much higher than the ones in the bottom half. In other words, we've got much stronger LOD scores, much better evidence for linkage if we assume complete LD. Uh, now remember, this is all really a linkage test. So what we're trying to test is uh, whether the recombination fraction is different from half or not. And in particular, trying to estimate the best value of the recombination fraction theta. And so the top LOD score we get is from one of our more complicated analysis models that tries to, to model all the complicating features, and indeed it maximizes at theta equals zero. So we get a LOD score of um, just about 10. Uh, it doesn't matter which sub-model we use. And if you compare this to really any of the other LOD scores, it's quite a lot bigger. Um, uh, but actually, you still get good evidence for linkage, even from the models that we wouldn't expect to fit very well. But um, in particular, the, the ones where we don't assume reduced penetrance have to assume that there must be a recombination fraction. There must be recombination between the measured variant and the disease allele in order to, to fit uh, the data. OK, we get similar results for Titan. Essentially, the best model is one of our complicating, complicated models, um, and it's quite a lot better, really, than, than anything else. It uh, maximizes at theta equals zero and under complete LD. Now, we can't directly compare the LOD scores in this table because they've actually all got different denominators because LOD scores are calculated as likelihood ratios um, with respect to on the bottom, the likelihood at theta equals a half. And for a start, we've got different models. And secondly, we've got different data. Some of these models include family 18, some of them don't. So if we want to actually compare numbers in a table, uh, what we need to calculate is the direct um, log 10 likelihood. So not divide by the likelihood at theta equals a half. And we need to make sure we're using the same data. So if we for example, restrict only to data sets that do include family 18. So here in this table, we can include, we can directly compare all the numbers. Um, and uh, the, the best fitting model, it seemed to be really considerably uh, higher than any of the other models apart from possibly it, its related um, sub model. Um, if we want to calculate um, our proposed likelihood ratio in favor of causality, we need to pick out these two numbers here that are uh, shown in green. If we instead want to calculate the Thompson et al. Um, uh, likelihood ratio, we need to also pick out these numbers here shown in yellow. And this is basically the likelihood calculated just with respect to the proband. And so we can use the same machinery, but we just set everyone in the pedigrees uh, genotypes to missing apart from the proband to calculate these likelihoods. OK, and we get similar results for Titan. OK, so for SLPK3, when you do this, the log 10 likelihoods in favor of causality um, ends up being uh, just over 81 using our approach or um, just over four using the Thompson et al. approach. So this means the data is 10 to the power of 81 times uh, greater assuming causality than not. So it's quite, quite convincing evidence. And actually, even using the Thompson et al. approach, it's quite convincing evidence, 10 to the power of four. Uh, similarly, for Titan, using our approach, um, we get nearly 80 uh, or uh, nearly six using uh, the Thompson et al. approach. Uh, but, we, but we do see that obviously our approach, which uses data um, from the probands rather than conditioning on it, does give you considerably stronger evidence. Okay, we also looked at the effect of um, modeling X XN activation, um, as shown in our top models, and not modeling it. Um, and again, uh, the likelihoods end up being about uh, 10 to the power of 20 higher when we do model X inactivation. We also looked at alternative reduced penetrance models. The one I had shown you before assumed 50% penetrance, but if you assume various different percentages of penetrance, we still get lots of models that do not fit nearly as well as our top models, either for SRPK3 or for Titan. We also used the pseudomarker program uh, to explore different assumptions regarding linkage disequilibrium. So before we had particularly assumed either no LD or complete LD, because that was what you needed to calculate the, um, the formula. But actually it's interesting to explore whether in fact an e intermediate level of LD would fit the data better. You get lots of things out of pseudomarker. I'll really just focus on this thing here, which is the maximum likelihood estimates of the 
LD parameters if you do assume there is linkage and LD. And you can see here that essentially you're, you're getting complete LD as being the best fitting model, suggesting that our measured variant is indeed in complete LD with our hypothetical disease allele. In other words, they are the same thing. Okay, so in, in conclusion, we've uh, found strong evidence of causality at both SRPK3 and Titan. Uh, the best fitting model does involve diagenic inheritance with you know, the other gene being important when we're fitting one model for one gene. Um, the likelihood of the data is at least 10 to the power of 10 times greater under this diagenic inheritance model than under any other model, at least any other model that we tried, uh, including a model where just one of the genes is operating but with reduced penetrance. Uh, the best fitting model does involve X inactivation at SRPK3 in heterozygous females, uh, and it involves an additional Titan variant operating in one family. Exactly as the data had originally suggested. And indeed, that's not surprising because we tailored our model to fit exactly what we thought the data would origin originally suggest. Um, so, so all we've really done is quantify it, which is what we were asked to do. How much better does this model fit compared to some other um, perhaps you know, sensible model? Uh, so obviously my collaborators were not waiting for me to come up with this before uh, continuing because they kind of already knew what was going on and so they um, were doing experimental work including doing some work on double mutant zebrafish um, with mutants in, in both genes uh, to show that indeed it seemed like uh, if you've got the double mutant then you get a severe muscle phenotype that's not observed in the, in the single mutants, uh, some RNA analysis and some 3D modelling uh, of what was going at SRPK3 um, to support the uh, the idea that these are, are indeed um, operating. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you, Heather. Great to see the all the methods being used again. Uh, we have a time for a quick one quick question, I think, before a break. So the end. Uh, very interesting, thanks. Uh, can you use this approach as a method for scanning the modifier genes? Suppose you didn't know TTN, so you just, and you have exome sequencing data, so just go over all the genes and try to see which one of them fits the, the model best? Um, I, I guess you could. Um, I mean, you'd, you'd have to sort of just repeatedly do the analysis um, using these rather old software packages that were not really designed for doing uh, you know, high throughput, large scale analysis, but in principle, there's no real reason why you couldn't. I mean, you probably just need to get together a kind of clever script that, that did a lot of that for you and then uh, called the program. Okay, thanks. Thank you, everyone. So.